Whoa, up in the mountains of Vatar. What an honor to be here. You know, it's important advertising. And the people who care about Ephraim should back the people who care about Ephraim to advertise what, they, what they're doing. I overheard a businessman ask another, is your advertising getting, getting results? This was in the, the inner city of New York City. He said, it sure is. Last week we advertised for Night Watchmen. The next night we were robbed. So Ephraim is being robbed of its heritage. So they need to, the people who appreciate this, like in the British Israel Society, they need to back people like Yair, who's trying to get this message out. That's why the, the globalists could take over. It's through their advertising. It's through their power of public relations, correct? Um, I was going through some of Yair's books, and each one of them he approaches with the, I would say, like the um, rigor of a scientist the drama of a storyteller, and the passion of a disciple presenting the, the history of the Ten Tribes and what happened to them. And anything he writes will greatly benefit the scholar and the layperson, because he supports everything with careful analysis of ancient sources and recent archeological discoveries and linguistic discoveries it's worth anybody's time. It's highly readable works he produced, rooted in Orthodox Torah history and heritage. And there's an engaging personal style about it. And it just helps anyone move forward towards understanding biblical history, heritage, and relationships. I'm going to do something a little different. I, I want to talk about the Holocaust, yeah, but not just about the Holocaust, but about what it has to do with Judah and Ephraim. So first you have to listen to some stuff about the Holocaust, and then you'll see the connection. If you have enough patience for this, you know, I can, you know, I guarantee it'll be interesting. But the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of a valley of dry bones. Who is the, wait, who is the easiest prophet to grasp? Ezekiel, Ezekiel, of course. So the nation of dry bones arriving was understood as a metaphor. A remarkable prayer service took place on Friday afternoon. It took place in April, 1945. And this is Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik's exposition of this famous recorded prayer service. The prayer service concluded with the singing of Atikva. The BBC's Patrick Walker, who described this event, assumed the singing was just part of the established liturgy. As the voices faded, one of the rabbis leading the service declared a few Hebrew words, a clarion call that can still be heard on the recording of the broadcast. So, Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik, he kind of put it together and brought out the Torah dimension. So way back when Jacob was dying and blessing the 12 tribes, those 12 brothers did not accept his death. They proclaimed that Jacob had not died, meaning he lived through them. He's alive above, upstairs, you know, and his spirit is inspiring all of Israel below. Thus we feel Jacob is still alive, Yaakov lo met. We feel that our God, who appears to us sometimes in a fatherly way, yet lives, and our nation is alive. So one of the rabbis cried out the above-mentioned verse, the people of Israel live. Oda bin Uchai, Am Yisrael Chai. The, the rabbis who historically have led us through all of our good times and also organized, helped, and rescued us in our difficult times, they have always proclaimed, Am Yisrael Chai, the nation of Israel lives. 
and Oda Vinochayim, yet our father lives. So Patrick Walker and the BBC were witness to a strange embodiment of a mark one week apart on the calendar. This was the worst and the most miraculous moment in our diaspora history, perhaps. For the first Yom HaShoah, which is Holocaust Remembrance, then comes Yom HaAtzmut, Israel Independence Day on our calendar. To better understand the rabbi's final words that define the service, let us take a walk with him at that time junction. The rabbi, Les Hardman, staffed to the British Second Army, had not been with the troops when the camp was liberated, but he was told to keep a stipper up, upper lip. We've just been into Belzen death camp, and it's horrible. You have to go there. You'll find a lot of your people. Okay. He first met a Jewish woman with a decrepit appearance. She was so horrifying that he instinctively backed away, provoking her to cry out in Yiddish, Palos mirnit, genita vekum mir. Don't leave me. Don't go away from me. Rabbi Hardman then helped her walk over to the many others. Towards, towards me came to me. They came towards me what seemed to be the remnants of a holocaust, a staggering mass of black skin and bones held together somehow with filthy rags. That's how he recalled. My God, the dead walk, I cried out, but I did not recognize my voice. All too soon he would learn that the walking dead were the lucky ones. The British created mass graves for the dead. Rabbi Hartman protested over the lack of respect for the dead, but was told, Padre, Father, <laughs> we've got to get them underground, otherwise we will all suffer from typhus. Thus were the Jews buried by the many thousands, denied everything in death that they were in life. So one haunting picture captures Rabbi Hartman standing Hardman standing all alone at a mass grave reciting Kaddish. That's a prayer for the uh, praising God, but it's also at the same time memorializing our dearly beloved who ever passed away. Many famous righteous people won, were among the bodies. Perhaps Anne Frank's body was there. She had died of typhus in the very camp just a little while before. This experience would remain with the rabbi the rest of his life. In this, he was not alone. Joining him and working for these refugees was Rabbi Hermann Hilfgott, a Hungarian rabbi serving with distinction in the Yugoslavian resistance army, who had himself just been freed from a prison of war camp. He now was attached to the British army. Rabbi Hilfgott recorded in... Um, in an uh, interview with, with Yad Vashem years later, right, he had a, um, what, what his experiences were there, and how one survivor, a mother, had beseeched him to defy British policy and bury a dead daughter in a single grave. This she did in the dark, but prayers were offered by the mother. She looked up to heaven and said, Master of the universe, thank you for the great privilege today of burying my daughter with my own hands. Amen. From that moment on, the rabbi was different and a new man each day. These and other rabbis were there standing side by side at the Sabbath service in which Patrick Walker witnessed and recalled, probably quoting him, probably the first Jewish service held on German soil with security without fear for a decade. Around us lay the corpses that had not been time to clear away, even after five days. During the service, a few hundred people gathered together were sobbing openly with joy at their liberation and with sorrow for the loss of their loved ones that had been taken from them, gassed and burned. These people knew they were being recorded. They wanted the world to hear their voice. They made a tremendous effort which exhausted them. Then there comes Hatikva with one woman's voice swelling amid the others. One woman's voice sung Hatikva. Her voice went above all the other voices. What we hear on the original lyrics our hope is not lost, the ancient hope to return to the land of our forefathers and the city settled by David. 
That was quoting Patrick. They were not the undead or the walking dead. No, they were of the holy Hebrew nation whose bodies had been ravaged but whose souls were still vibrant within. When What Patrick Walker did not know is that what's taking place was a mere reenactment of the biblical story that inspired Naphtali Embers Hatikva. The prophet spoke of dry bones coming back to life. We know those exact bones in a metaphor of the prophet Ezekiel were referring to return of the dry bones of our lost tribes. Patrick Walker and the entire British Isles are actually, however, minimally the remnants of our lost tribes. Our tribes ended up in Western Europe and became England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the USA, and a thin strip in South Africa, having also to pass through Germany and Scandinavia. For example, quote Yair, you know, Yair Davidi, the great Yair Davidi. It was also prophesied that the lost tribes would be go west. Hosea 11, 10 to 9 to 10. I will not ex execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of you, and I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. The Aramaic translation in our, in our great sages understands that this means that the exiles will return from the west. From this we see that the lost tribes would be in the west. Other forces mention the north and other directions, but all such references you have to consider that it's in the context of emanating from the west. So they came from the west, they went north, they came from the west. It, they, all the other directions are in conjunction with each other and are complementary to each other. Um, I don't know if you people have heard of her, but a great woman scholar is named Nechama Sara, N-A-D-B-O-R-N-Y, Nadborni. And Yaelit Chain published her, The Twelve Dimensions of Israel. And, and she's, she says of her, she understands how we all have 12 tribes within us, and we could all use our different tribal uh, DNA, RNA, as Hebrews to grow and serve God, right? That doesn't deny that the, they're still separate tribes, but we all have something of each other in, in ourselves. So she says in the ingathering of the exiles, history uh, unfolding in a macrocosmic process of tshuva return, parallel to the course put in motion by Adam and Chava, Eve's pre-mortal transgression, which caused the initial fragmentation of the human soul into 70 archetypal nations. The emergence of the Hebrew nation and the giving of the Torah marks a direction of realignment and reclamation of unity. The political arena is a reflection of what is happening internally through the individual process of return. So during this time of redemption that we're in, the diverse peoples the dispersed people of Israel returning home and eventually in their specific land inheritance will it all work out. This reabsorption of energy and resuscitation of the world's heartbeat will awaken the world to the realization of the essential unity under the unity reflecting the unity of a one God of pure spirit. I'm adding that. And just as the individual gathers back into a centralized kind of, you could say a yud, you'd symbolize as a centralized seed. Um, all peoples will reunite under God, under this cosmic universal kind of yud, and the center will be Jerusalem and the historical site of the Garden Eden, and all that depends on the 12 tribes getting back together. The point I wanted to make here is these Western countries, they freed Israel from the Ottoman Turk domination and back to creation of the state of Israel. One of the signs of the lost tribes is that they're helping us and will help Judah to return to the land. So the metaphor, the awakening of, of the Valley of Dry Bones is speaking of Ephraim, Joseph, the 10 lost tribes. We are in the beginning of the period when Ephraim, Joseph, and the 10 lost tribes will start to awaken in, to their Hebrew identity. For details and research and proof of the above statements, you are referred 
to the website of Britam Hebrew Nation of the Orthodox Jewish researcher Yair Davidi. Our lost tribes are starting to wake up and Judah's revival is an inspiration for the tribes to come of age. Judah has taken the metaphor of the dry bones, we borrowed it from Ephraim, and in a homiletical way, not in a, pshat, a literal way, in a homiletical way, has applied it to ourselves. Ezekiel's is shown a valley of dry bones that miraculously comes back to life. Behold, they say our bones are dry, right? And our hope is lost. Therefore prophecy prophesies and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, on my people, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Our hope is lost in Hebrew means Abad Tikvatenu. Naphtali Ember's song lyrics run Od Lo Abad Tikvatenu. Our hope is not lost. At Belzim, the biblical and temporary, temporary times merged. The Jews were like skeletons, a staggering mess of blackened skin and bones held together by torn, ripped up, dirty garments. But they were found to possess the wellsprings of hope, illustrated why Am Yisrael Chai, the nation of Israel, lives. So... Patrick was also awoken, and tens of millions of non-Jewish people who were were awoken by to feel for the Jewish people. Now there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people that were happy. They criticized Hitler as being a maniac and a, and a monster, but he, at least he did something right. He killed Jews. This is what hundreds of millions of people, and you can't get away from the fact that these countries refuse to take Jews in even though Jews have good reputations for enriching countries. That's where their hatred went. So those millions of people that felt an attachment to the Jews, that felt warmth for the Jews, that felt empathy for the Jews, they are, are really, it's their Hebrew hearts beating within them that were starting to be woken up. And the rising of Israel out of the, of the Hebrew Jews, of Judah, which also has remnants of the, all the tribes, out of the ashes, did something to them. Over many years, I'm talking, hundreds of people have told me the Holocaust connected them to the Jewish people and to have more respect for them and to their Judaism, which previously they had no respect for either. And those people gravitated and were even more thrilled with the state of Israel. And they tracked out their own Hebrew roots and they discovering their Ephraimite identity. So the dry bones coming back were the dry bones when Judah sort of awaked from the grave. It spontaneously ignited millions of Ephraimites to awake from their grave and come out from their dry bones and reconnect to the uh, uh, Ephraimite identity, to a Hebrew identity. Rabbi Hadman, Hardman would soon officiate at the wedding of Norman Turgill, a British Jewish soldier, combat soldier, who had fallen in love with a survivor of Belzin named Jenner Goldfinger. The, the wedding dress was made from a British parachute and is on permanent display at London's Imperial War Museum. Rabbi Helfgott wrote a ketubah from memory for, for another couple. It records, as every ketubah for 2,000 years has, the location and content of the Jew Jewish journey. Joining In Beg and Belzen, we are told, a groom named Moses said to a bride named Miriam, be unto me, my woman, according to the laws of Moshe and Israel. The language of the ketubah, which is like a prenuptial agreement to provide for the woman in case of divorce and to cherish, honor, and support her, 2,000 years ago, it was a very modern document protecting the daughters of Israel. Health God, many years later, would visit the couple and see the living vindication of Ezekiel's ancient vision, Israel being a vindication of that ancient vision. Decades after the service, an Israeli woman named Mrs. Aviv described attending her son's ceremony, completing an officer's course in the Israel Defense Forces. She was unmoved by the fanfare until Hatikva was sung. My thoughts were with my mother, who at that time 
now is was 64 years earlier in the horrific Belzen camp. She sang this song. The woman we hear in the BBC recording is the boy's grandmother, Cecia Anhorn, the woman whose voice swelled among the others and and rose above all the other all the others voices was Anhorn's verse, Grandma Anhorn, full of determination for the for the nation, warning the world to know that despite all she and others had suffered through, they had not lost hope and still dreamed of returning one day to Zion. Mrs. Aviv wept as she watched her child, Cisa and Horn's grandson, become an officer in the Jewish army that did not exist quoting her, did not exist 64 years ago to save the camp prisoners. My mother's hope and determination were not for naught. Those who Les Hartman saw initially as the weakest specimen ultimately revealed themselves to be among the strongest individuals in history. They hoped and were lifted from the grave and embodied the endurance of an eternal nation, as per Rob Mayor Soloveitchik explains. If there was a single point of light in the Holocaust, it is this. There are two camps. This is from a Holocaust survivor who's a great, great Talmud scholar, passed away, may you rest in peace, Rabbi Yehuda Amital. There were two camps. There are on one side the camp of the murderers, on the other side the camp of the murdered. Sure, there were those who were partially guilty in between. So you have the perpetrators, the victims, and the bystanders, as Raoul Hilbert points out. However, the bystanders actually closed their gates, doors, and windows to us and others. So they assisted the murderers by doing nothing. Here we are dealing with the position of Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, as victims. Happy are we that we belong to the camp of the murdered. The heavens and earth can testify on our behalf, points out Rabbi Yehuda Amital. If we had been given an opportunity to reverse roles, we would have preferred to be the victim than among the murderers. This historical laser beam point to brilliant, points a brilliant light that cannot be forgotten or overshadowed. As per Rabbi Yehuda Amital, facing the world of murderers, a world that stood by as the blood of millions was cynically shed, we stood on the other side. All the world on one side, and with a few exceptions, we were on the other side. Personally, you know, like Abraham, he was on one side of the world. That's what the world every Hebrew also means to go over. And everyone else was on the side of a paganism, practically, with few exceptions. Um, I, I personally can't get over the Canadian attitude. How many Jewish refugees are you willing to take? So the general attitude in Canada was none are too many. We know, as the Rambam Maimonides states in his letter to the Yemenite Jews, that all the hatred that the nations feel towards us is because of the Torah, because of our closeness to the Holy One. Therefore, we state before God in Psalm 45, it is for your sake that we are killed all day long, that we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But at the same time, we have punishable shortcomings recorded in our written and oral Torah. Psalm 45 again, if we forget the name of our God and spread forth our hands to foreign gods, to man-made gods, to man and women gods, we would, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. In the end, we don't fully grasp the depth and breadth of his plan. Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Our job is to comfort the nation and one another. Be comforted, Nachamu, spoken to Israel. Nachamu, be comforted again, spoken to the nations. My people says your God tenderly to Jerusalem and declare to her that her term of service is complete that her sin has been pardoned, for she has suffered from God's hands for her sins. Isaiah 40, you see her sins have been pardoned. She has suffered double for her sins, those that were before and those that were after. We have psychologists, etc., who don't have the depth and sufficient scope to get it when dealing with 
Holocaust survivors. Also, there are elements that seek to suppress the memory of the Holocaust. There are states like Switzerland and Western Ukraine and parts of Poland that likewise twist and suppress history. Right this second, in the Western Ukraine, the Azur Army identifies with the symbols of the SS and Gestapo. They are organizations and global movements that want to secularize the Holocaust as just another nasty event. There are huge powerful forces that want to humanize it and exercise any specific, specifically Jewish component. Those are things that we're against in our education. But what we need to work, put our, our dagesh or emphasis on is educating Judah and Ephraim that we are both with dry bones that they're dry bones and they're waking up and coming out of the grave and symbolically we're imitating them too we're coming out of our graves and what's our life and what's the length of our days Torah Ki heim chayenu so we say the Kaddish prayer for those who have gone for our Ephraimites who are gone, for Judah that's gone. But we together express what's in our hearts and on many occasions, like Yisker and synagogues and yeshivas. We remember that we are, that we rebury, remourn, and bring merits to our dearly departed. That we still assemble and often in great numbers says something great about the nation. Despite lack of comprehension and questions, nonetheless, we cry out the Kaddish prayer and declare, Yiskadal v'yiskadash shamei rabo. May God's great name be elevated and sanctified. And may Judah and Ephraim recognize each other as the brothers they are. And we should all live happily ever after.